We have a beautiful legacy, a beautiful history, and we have a beautiful future in Christ. Amen. And so I have a, a message for you, and I want you to turn to the book of Mark. And uh, as you're turning there, I'm just going to pray real quick. Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for every person in this room. I pray for strength. I pray for grace. I pray for mercy upon every heart, upon every, uh, upon every life, upon every home, upon every marriage. I thank you, Jesus, for mercy, for grace, for life. We honor you. We love you. We give you all that we are today. Bless this time in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. I have a little message that um, the Lord was kind of stirring in my, in my heart this last week as I was uh, in quarantine, hallelujah, <laughs> in my room <laughs> watching movies and, and listening to preaching and listening to my Bible and stuff, I, the Lord gave me a download, and, and, and it was really good, and, and it, was, it was just good for my soul. And so I want to title this, Remember and Don't Forget. Say, Remember, remember. and Don't Forget. <laughs> And you could turn to Mark chapter 6 if you were wondering where in Mark. And Mark chapter 6, and we'll look at 6, and we'll look at Mark 6 and Mark 8. And Mark chapter 6 is the amazing story <clears throat> of uh, feeding the 5,000. And I just love this story. I love the, the multiplication. I love the miracle working power. Um, and... I'll just read a couple verses in, in chapter 6 here. It says, When Jesus came out and he saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion. Compassion, that's a big deal. He was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. And so he began to teach many things. And then he realized that they were hungry. And so he turns to the disciples. He says, You give them something to eat. Verse 37. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they went out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups in the, on the green grass. And so they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves, so he, he took the bread, he took the five loaves, the two fish, he looked up to heaven, he blessed the food, he broke the bread, and he gave it to the disciples. I want you to remember those things as we continue with this message that he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he multiplied the bread. Somebody say amen. And he gave it back to the disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they, were all, they all ate and they all were filled. That's a miracle. Yes. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and full of fish. And now those that had eaten uh, the loaves were about 5,000 men. That is incredible. Uh, so that's Mark chapter 6. That is the first uh, example, the first story that we see where he feeds the multitudes, where there is many crowding him, and it says exactly what he does. He takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it, he multiplies it. But then we see again in Mark chapter 8, um, this isn't just the same story being told twice. This is another, <laughs> just, a, just a little while later, he does another amazing miracle. And I want you just to listen to this. So remember, he had compassion it says, and then he be, because he had compassion, he began to teach them because they were like sheep having no shepherd. And because he had compassion, he multiplied the bread and gave them something to physically to eat. Amen. And so it says in chapter eight, verse two, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continue with, continued with me for three days and they have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry on their, on their own, to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar off. 
Then his disciple answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? (laughs) They just don't get it. (laughs) He asked them, How many loaves do you have? It's the same question. And they said, "Uh, Seven. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves. Hallelujah. He gave thanks. He broke them. And he gave them to the disciples to set before them and the multitude. And they also had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said to set them before all of them. And they ate and they were filled. Then they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Come on, somebody. 4,000 people. So 5,000 people get a miracle. They're eating. They're getting the word. I mean, this is like an awesome meeting. Like, they don't have to go cook something. They're getting, it's, everything's multiplied. And then 4,000 people get totally fed. And, and it's just this incredible miracle. But the thing that I want to focus on is what happens after this miracle. And this is kind of what the Lord was, was speaking to me this last week. And, and it starts in verse 11 because this, the Pharisees come and they say, then the Pharisees came out and they began to dispute with him. Seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Wow. And that's interesting that they say this because this is directly after he just made an incredible miracle. 4,000 people just got fed with a couple loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And they're saying, show us proof. We want proof. <laughs> and he's like, I just fed 5,000 people and I just fed 4,000 people. And so this is a, this is a spirit. And, and so listen, so that's a, verse 11 and verse 12. And then this happens in verse 13. A lot of Bible reading today, We're, but you're Okay. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. And now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Oh, come on, guys. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They're like... Uh, huh? <laughs> we're just, I just said I just, we only brought one loaf of bread. What, what, is, what, is, what is he talking about? No, this is a teaching moment. Um, and, and I want to show you what's going on because, see, l- listen to these words. These are very strong words. Um, it says that he, he charged them. That is a word that means, um, in the Greek, it means beware. It means that he strongly warned them. This wasn't a casual, like, hey, guys, I just want you to know, like, please beware. Be cautious of the leaven of the Pharisees. No, it says that he strongly cautioned them. He warned them. He was saying, beware of this. These are very strong words. Take heed. In the Greek, horeo, take heed, means to watch out, to think very seriously about, to what you are hearing, what you are seeing, to be very alert. That would be like uh, somebody in these times telling somebody when they would when they would use these type of words. It would be like somebody saying, "Watch out for the poisonous food. That don't eat that. Or there's a snake. Watch out. You know, like this is the kind of warning that Jesus is giving when he's talking. It's not this casual thing. It's not just this nice little teaching. It's it's whoa." Hold on, like there, there's trouble. Take heed. <laughs> Watch out. There's a poisonous snake. There's, a, pl- there's a, a hole you're about to fall into. Beware. Move slowly. Move carefully. Move intentionally. This, this is the, the verbiage. This, these words matter in the Bible. Right? And, the, and, how, and how Jesus speaks matters. And you gotta, you got to understand how he's speaking to his disciples. And so he's saying, these are strong words that he's using when he's saying, I'm charging you, I'm warning you, please beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And what is the leaven of the Pharisees? It is hypocrisy. 
It is a unbelief. It's a religious spirit. It's, it's this. It's, it's the very thing that just happened. You see, the, the, the disciples saw a miracle. They saw 4,000 people get <laughs> fed. The, the Pharisees saw this incredible miracle. And now they say, we want a sign. They just saw it, but yet they did not believe. Their heart was still hard. Uh, the leaven of the Pharisee is rooted in spiritual pride. It's rooted in a hard heart. Uh, a heart that is hard towards the things of God. When we are supposed to be tender towards the things of the Spirit. Amen? And so he's saying, guys, this is, this is exactly what just happened with these guys. And I want to caution you. I want to I strongly warn you. See, you're coming onto this boat and you're saying, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. We only have one bread, one loaf of bread. I don't know how we're going to eat. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a minute. <laughs> don't you remember what I just did? Say, remember. remember. And don't forget. Don't forget. Let's, let's finish reading what, what Jesus said here. And they reasoned among themselves saying, is it because we have no bread? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> but Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive and do you not yet understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets did, of fragments did you take up? They said seven. And so he said to them, how is it that you do not understand this? Wow. So the leaven of the Pharisees is pride, spiritual pride. It's hypocrisy. It's unbelief. It's a religious spirit. It's a hardening of your heart. Um, and it's like that song that Patrick was, that the, the team was singing, Take Me Back to My First Love Fire. When we first got saved, it was just like this childlike faith. And you believed that anything was possible. And then all of a sudden, life happens and, and COVID happens and all these things. And you're like, well, is it, is, is it really going to happen? Is that miracle really going to take place? And we begin to doubt. And we begin to doubt the God of the heavens and the earth. Amen. And he says, and he says beware of the leaven of not just the Pharisees, but beware of the leaven of Herod. What is the leaven of Herod, which is creeping into the culture during this time? And it's creeping into the culture in our time. And the, the leaven of Herod is worldliness. It's also hypocrisy. And it is this spirit that puts politics above the kingdom of God. And any time that we put politics and political people or anything in front of the kingdom of God, we are out of balance. We're out of whack. We're out of alignment. And he's saying, beware of this. Because this will, this, when this gets into the bread, it will, it will creep in and it will spoil the whole batch. Hallelujah. But the main thing is the, the Pharisees here. I think this is what he's, the, the parallel and the point that he's trying to make because it just, it literally just happened. And he's saying, don't act like the Pharisees that quickly forget or forgot what God did and need another miracle, need another prophetic word, need another confirmation, need another su such and such um, to convince them when it literally just happened. I don't want to be that person that always needs convincing that, i got to have five more prophetic words to confirm what I already know to be true in my heart. And I've done this. I, we've all done this. And it's, it's, there's no condemnation. But let's just let's be better. Amen? Yeah. Remember. And, uh, and the thing that God was just kind of speaking to me is, if I did it before, I could do it again. If I did it before... I can do it again. And, you know, we've been living in crazy times. Can somebody say amen, hallelujah, pass the biscuits? <laughs> it's been a crazy. It's just been a crazy two years. And, um, and there's just been a lot of spiritual fatigue in our country. 
and uh, emotional fatigue, mental fatigue, and people are just, there's so much uncertainty. And, you know, uncertainty can drive you into a place of worry. It can drive you into a place of fear. It can drive you into a place of, of doubt and unbelief. And it, 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 but we're not supposed to be driven by anything. We're supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen? See, fear drives us. And so, but, but this uncertainty that we've all been feeling for two years, it drives us into this unhealthy place and a place of fear, a place of worry, a place of doubt. Uh, but the thing that we have to remember, and as I, as I look at scriptures, they, they all were facing uncertain times. Many times, again and again and again. And they had the choice to be driven into a place of fear or to settle themselves in a place of hope and anchor themselves in, in a place of hope. Amen? And so crazy times and political turmoil, it shouldn't scare us. It should make us happy. Uh, because this is a time where our, our faith can be strengthened like never before. The church can come alive like never before. Come out of the closet, church. <laughs> this is your year to shine. And it's, it's, uh, it's just a beautiful time. Uh, it's an invitation to hope. Say invitation. But we have to remember um, to not forget who God is in our story. And I think that is what the, the enemy is, is systematically trying to do over the last two years is cause us um, to forget who he is in our story. Cause us to, to just focus all on ourselves and focus on everything bad. And, and, but, but God say, no, remember who I am. Don't even just remember who you are. That's great. You need to know who you are in Christ. But besides that, remember who he is. <laughs> remember who God is in your story. Amen. And so this was kind of what was happening to me. You know, this, this last week I got sick and, and I'm sitting uh, in my room on, uh, you know, in quarantine, trying not to get everybody else sick in my family. And, and I just begin to feel a little discouraged. Um, and I'm feeling weary, and I'm feeling a little fatigued of, of two years of fighting and two years of, of political tension and, and just turmoil, and it's, it just wears on you, right, emotionally, spiritually, physically. And I'm sitting in my bed, and I'm just feeling overwhelmed, and I'm like, gosh, you know, why that, you know, and your mind goes in a million directions. Why the heck would we try to start a new campus in the middle of a pandemic? Why, you know, all these things and, and just going in this downward spiral. And, and I'm like, I just need to get my mind off of this. And so I, I decided to watch a movie. And uh, I've been watching some movies and, and I'm laughing. I just, you know, just good, good, you know, clean. I like clean uh, family movies. I like, I like movies that make me laugh. And uh, so I'm watching some, like, PG and G-rated movies, and, and there's some great ones. And, um, and I'm watching these, and all of a sudden, I'm like, what? I don't know why I decided to do this about five movies in. You know? <laughs> You've got a lot of time when you're just sitting in your room. Uh, I'm about five movies in, and, and I was, it's like a plane ride to Mongolia. And, <laughs> and I, I look at the date of the movie, and the date that the movie was made was 2006. I'm like, huh. 2006, that's interesting. And I'm like, just thinking about 2006 for a minute. And I'm like, oh, that was, yeah, there was some cool movies that were made. And I looked up a list, and there was some great movies, some of my favorite movies. Nacho Libre was made in 2006. Hallelujah. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> uh, my, one of my son's favorite movies, Cars, that was made in 2006. There was some great movies. And so, but I'm just thinking about this stuff. And then I, I, uh, I look back at the last four movies that I had watched, and I'm like, I wonder when those ones were made. And they all were made in 2006. I'm like, I just watched five movies by accident that were all made in 2006. This is, what, what, what is what's happening right now? And I felt the, in that moment, and the Lord speaks to all of us in, in crazy ways. And sometimes when we're stuck in a rut, he needs to use different means to communicate to us. <laughs> And so here I am in a rut, and the Lord says, I want you to remember what I did in your life in 2006. And I'm like, hmm, okay. And so I get a piece of paper. I'm sitting in my bed, and I begin to write some things down that happened in 2006. 
And, and this is interesting, too, I, 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 because in 2002 to 2005, I was a missionary in Mongolia. I saw miracles, signs, and wonders. I saw some, it was some of the greatest years of my life were those three years in Mongolia. And um, we got to send missionaries into the Stan countries, North Korea, parts of China. Um, it was just a very fruitful time. And the gospel literally went all over Mongolia. And it's bearing fruit to this day. So it was a powerful three years. But I came back at the end of 2005 feeling discouraged uh, because I didn't know what my next step was. And I'm back here feeling discouraged, feeling overwhelmed, feeling, God, do you know me? God, do you hear me? It, it do, are these prophecies for real? You know, just real stuff, real life uh, at the end of 2005. And so I'm, and I even like looked at journal entries from, from t- January 2006. And I'm just like, Lord, you know, I need you. I'm feeling confused, you know, all this stuff. So this is, that's the beginning of 2006 for me. Confusion, frustration, uncertainty, what's next? God, are you going to come through? And then I begin to, but I begin to write down the things that happened uh, in the rest of that year, 2006. You see, because at the beginning, I felt this. I felt uncertainty. I felt fear. I felt all the things that we feel, but I chose to worship. And I chose to stay in the word. And I chose to stay in prayer. And I chose to stay in a position in a place of hope. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. And all of a sudden, stuff began to happen. And so 2006, I met my wife. Hallelujah. (laughs) Uh, 2006, you know, I I get a call to uh, to, to become a youth pastor down in Bishop at the neighborhood church. So I start youth pastoring down there. That's actually where I met her. That's where I met this guy for the first time. Hallelujah. It's a divine connection. Um, and I start, uh, Sean and I start a, 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 a nonprofit during 2006. I take a trip to, to back to Asia in the summer of 2006. And this was one of the most significant mission trips of my life. Uh, I saw this boy that was dying, one month to live, brain tumor. He was, he, they, the doctors gave him no hope to live. And he gets completely 100% healed. Amen. And then they send, he goes back, this is a Buddhist family, he goes back to the, uh, you know, to their home, and revival breaks out in the church because everybody knows this kid's story, everybody knows that this is a Buddhist family. And revival breaks out. This was 2006. The Lord's like, remember what I did in 2006. And it was such a, such a amazing, so many dreams and visions, and the prophetic was just on point, and I'm like, just amazing stuff was taking place. I come back. And I'm asked to start leading um, the youth group from the lighthouse and the youth group from uh, the neighborhood church. I'm leading two youth groups. And a couple times, we actually met at Penny McCoy's house. It was amazing. But this bridge begins to be built in 2006. And people came up to me and they said, you're building a bridge that hasn't been built and walked across for a long time. This bridge between Mammoth and Bishop. Crowley, Mammoth, Bishop, and sometimes there's segregation, and people do it not on purpose, but it just happens, and these people came up to me, and they said, but you're building a bridge, and you're breaking down the walls. This is 2006, and, and, uh, and so the Lord's like, I want you to remember what I did. He gave me a vision uh, of in 2006 to put on a youth conference in Mongolia. It just, I mean, it was just straight from the Lord. And we did. The following summer, 2007, Patrick and I and, and 10 other people, we went to Mongolia, and 1,000 young people came, and it was an incredible time. Miracles, signs, wonders, salvations, and uh, so much fruit, you know, that I'm still hearing to this day, years later. That was 2007. But this, all of this stuff happened in 2006. And um, the Lord spoke to me so clearly to marry, to marry my wife in 2006, I mean, I, I just started listening. I mean, it was like nonstop. I'm thing after thing after thing after thing after thing. And the Lord was saying, I, I am the same God. The same God that was with you then. I'm with you now. And the same uncertainty that you were feeling then is what you're feeling now. It's a little different because of stuff in our country, but it's, it's a feeling that's similar. And I'm like, Lord, where are we going as a country? Where are we going as a church? How do we navigate this thing and navigate sickness and navigate all these things 
And the Lord's saying, no, I want you to revisit. I want you to remember. I want you not to forget who I am in your story, what I have already done in your story. I want you to remember that I've already split the Red Sea in your story. And if I did it then, I could do it now. Come on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> come on. Patrick, can you, you can come up here. I'm not going to preach very long today, but this is, uh, this, I feel like God's going to meet us in just a second here and, and, and speak to your hearts. And so in, in this year, um, it was such a, such a fruitful such a fruitful year for me, and, and there's been many fruitful years after that as well, but, but for whatever reason, 2006, um, it was just a powerful, life-changing year, uh, and that came on, <laughs> that came right after a very fruitful year, and I'm just reminded of this story, you know, Mark chapter 8, it was a very fruitful, powerful event, the feeding of the 4,000. And then they quickly forgot, and they quickly said, how are we going to eat? We only have one loaf of bread. What are we going to do? And, and this is the leaven of the Pharisees that begins to creep into our culture and creep into the church. It's this thing that causes us to forget. It's this thing that causes us to have a hard heart to, and not be sensitive, not be tender to the things of the Spirit. The Pharisees had a hard heart. They for, quickly forgot what God had done in, the, in their story. And, and so the Lord's saying, do not take the leaven of the Pharisees. My disciples, he's saying, yeah, you think you just have one piece of bread, but what, what you're doing right now, what you're partnering with right now is, is a spirit of unbelief. You're not remembering who I am. Peter, John, didn't you just pass out? All that food? Didn't you just see the smiles on people's faces as you kept breaking bread and more kept getting multiplied? And now you're on the boat and you're freaking out because you only have one loaf again? Come on, guys. And so the Lord does something in these two stories. And I said this in the beginning. The Lord does something very powerful and, and significant in both of these stories. He takes the bread. He blesses the bread. He breaks the bread. And he multiplies the bread. And you are the bread today. You come as the bread and you come with your problems and you come like what can the Lord do with this one loaf what can the Lord do with my heart and with my life but I feel like God's just saying I want to take you I want to draw you close to myself I want to speak into your heart I want to speak and whisper over you and speak over you the truth of heaven he brings you close and he blesses you he blesses your life and then he breaks you. <laughs> he doesn't put sickness on us to teach us a lesson. He doesn't break us in the way that your mind might be thinking. Breaking you is breaking that mindset of the Pharisees. Breaking spiritual pride. Remember this story, great story in the Bible. There's so many stories you can, you can turn to and people, but one of my favorite is Moses. Moses was a man of God. And if there's anybody that did the miraculous and walked in signs and wonders, it was, it was our boy Moses. <laughs> Some of the most <laughs> massive miracles took place in the book of Exodus. But think about the life of Moses. Moses who was raised in Pharaoh's house and taught the Egyptian way and taught the Egyptian wisdom. He had so much skill, so much understanding, so much knowledge, so much pride. And then it took 40 years in the desert for God to begin to soften that heart, for God to begin to make the man a God. 
as he began to feed the sheep and spend time in the desert, raise his kids and marry a wife, all of a sudden something starts happening in this, in this man. And, and the Lord says, there's a man I can use. There's a tender man. There's a humble man. And he draws Moses out and he begins to speak to him. And what does Moses say? He says, I can't go. I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. You can't use me. This is coming from a man who was going to be given so much position, so much authority in Egypt. A man that had been trained, a man that had been equipped. And now he's saying, I, I don't have what it takes. And the Lord's like, now I know you're the one. <laughs> the Bible actually tells us, the Bible tells us that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Did you know that? He was at that particular time in history, he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And the Bible says that he exalts the humble, gives grace to the humble, resists the proud. And so this thing about about, about breaking us. He will use situations and he will use seasons to mold us and to draw us closer to himself. I think of Joseph. Something so powerful happened in the life of Joseph, David, even Paul. I mean, you could look at any person's life in the scriptures. And this is what God has been doing with our life in, in 2020, 2021. He didn't make this happen, but he will use what the enemy meant for destruction. He will use it for good. And he's using this for good to draw his church closer to his heart. He's using this for good by, by letting the authentic and the organic and the fresh church arise from the ashes. A church with a voice. A church with a heart. A church that remembers. A church that's tender. A church that is led and not driven. time preachers, Charles Spurgeon, Finney, you go back in church history, many would, would you, they wrote their prayers down many times and they would pray prayers like, God, break us. God, break us. <laughs> Bend us. Break us. Make us. <laughs> because they understood this principle. They understood this thing that in order to make us, God has to break us. Break the pride. Break the spiritual pride. Break the the religious systems that we've been believing that have crept into our heart and mind, the systems of Herod, the systems of the Sadducees. You see, in Matthew, it even says that there's leaven of the, of the Sadducees. The leaven of the Sadducees is also a religious spirit. They were so stuck on the Torah, and you can't go outside of this, and it's a different kind of religious spirit. But he's saying there's leaven of the Sadducees, there's leaven of the Pharisees, and there's leaven of Herod. And do not allow it to infect your heart because it'll spoil your life. He's got to break us to make us, amen. And there's something that is happening right now in the spirit. There's something that's happening in Church on the Mountain. And there's something, there's just something right now. God's saying, remember. Remember who I am. Remember the stones of testimony. Remember what I did with the Wise family, with the Hensler family, with the Rowan family, with the Pearson family. Remember what I did and remember what I established in this house long ago. Remember healthy families that were birthed out of this home, out of this church family. Many healthy marriages, healthy children were sent all over the world. He said, remember that. Remember, I could build on that. We don't have to build on everything. And some stuff that came out of this house was man, but there was so much that was God. And you build on what is the Lord. And you remember what is the Lord. And I feel like the Lord is just taking us and causing us to, to look back for a moment. And remember what he has done. And even in your own journey. 
I want you to close your eyes with me. I've already been closing my eyes. Close your eyes and I just want you to think back for a minute. In your story, And I want you to just to remember when God just did something, when God came through, when he answered that prayer. Come on. got to remember. Remember who I am in your story, the Lord says. Remember and don't forget. (laughs) Don't forget. You don't can't, we can't camp out in, in the past, but you have to remember your history. You have to remember who God is. So Jesus, we just thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, that you're moving in this house right now. You're drawing us close. Lord, you are near to the brokenhearted. <laughs> he says he, he breaks us, but he doesn't leave us. The Bible says he is near to the broken. And that's not just when somebody passes away. There's many things in life that cause us to be broken in our heart cause us to feel broken in situations in life and God is closer than a whisper in those seasons we've all felt very broken and out of sorts over the last two years but I could tell you over the last two years even in the midst of chaos I can hear God so clearly I can I can talk to him so intimately I feel like he's so close because he is he's with us in the valley he's with us on the mountaintops He's with us in the wilderness. He's with us in every season of our life. So Jesus, I just pray right now, cause people to remember who you are in their story. God, when they had um, a visitation, when they had an encounter with you that changed everything, Lord, cause people in this room right now to remember that Damascus Road experience with you. To remember how you saved their child and saved the prodigal. God, help them right now. Remember, remember the Red Sea that was split. The food that was multiplied. Come on. Let's just stand to our feet. We're going to worship. And I I just feel like God's just stirring, stirring something today. Stirring your spirit. Stirring your heart. Causing you to remember. And I feel like some of you even have to begin to, just as I did. I sat in my room. I sat in my room discouraged and I left my room encouraged as I begin to remember who God was in my story. And so I feel like some of you need to specifically write some things down and and you just need to look at it over the next couple of days and remind yourself of who God has been in your life, who he's been in your family, 
and what he has already accomplished. So let's, let's worship the Lord. And uh, yeah, and just, I just encourage you, write those things down. Father, thank you for this day. I pray blessing, 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 favor, healing and protection, grace over this group of people. In the mighty and in the precious name of Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We bless you in Jesus' name. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Oh, you are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. You are here. I worship you, I worship you, Lord. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are forevermore, God. We remember your miracles, your miracles, Lord. Oh, we remember nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you, God. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. 